Good day, and welcome to this presentation of Applied Mathematics in STEM Education, where we will explore differ differentiated learning and real-world curriculum alignment techniques in addition to exploring a vast array of mathematical concepts. Our agenda today is as follows. I'd like to start with a cultural perspective of STEM education, followed by a discussion on project and inquiry-based learning before getting into larger STEM project ideas. Then we'll explore a range of project ideas which will include land surveys, architectural design, aerospace engineering, structural engineering, and vector graphics. As this is the last presentation in the series, I'd like to conclude with a slightly different review of STEM education, one that focuses on a unique cultural perspective of STEM education here in China. Now, you may have noticed a common theme in all of my in-service programs. I'm constantly looking to our past as I work towards understanding our present, and I do this so I can plan curricula that will help prepare our students for the future. There's a famous saying which states, studying the past helps us to understand the present. However, what most people don't realize is that this is actually a translated quote from Confucius that's over 2,000 years old. Yet, it still is relevant today as when he first wrote the idea in the Lun Yun Yu, otherwise known as the Confucius Analects. And in the modern era, We've advanced our concepts of teaching in, um, significantly and have conducted countless research studies. Ideas such as Bloom's taxonomy and the learning pyramid that I'm showing here are the cornerstones of most academic reforms. Whether you agree with them or not is a completely different story. However, regardless of your take on these pedagogical approaches towards teaching and learning, I would like you to look at this visual from the National Training Laboratories in Maine. It states that lecture-based instruction has the lowest retention rates. I listen and I forget. However, demonstrations are far more effective. I see and I remember. And finally, practice by doing and teaching others is the most effective teaching strategy when trying to learn new knowledge. I do and I understand. However, this too was a philosophy of education that had been put forward by Confucius more than 2,000 years ago. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Chinese history, Confucius was born in 551 BCE and was one of China's most famous philosophers. Fast forward more than 2,000 years, the World Economic Forum has indicated that the way that we teach STEM is out of date, stating that it lacks a connection with the social, economic, and political impacts of our students' work. After all, knowledge without morals, ethics, and compassion can be one of the most destructive forces found in nature. Therefore, when China announced the introduction of STEM education into its curriculum, they didn't just adopt the existing model of STEM education. Instead, the central government outlined its own interpretation of STEM education, which they refer to as STEM plus Su Jiu or moral education. Therefore, the entire idea of the Chinese educational framework surrounding STEM education actually revolves around ethics and morality. Moreover, Xi Jinping has also indicated that the role of universities is to cultivate students with good values and moral integrity. And when I look at this quote, it reminds me again of the teachings of Confucius. To put the world in order, we must first put our nation in order. To put the nation in order, we must first put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must first cultivate our personal life. We must first set our hearts right. Therefore, China does not seek to implement an outdated version of STEM that only focuses on knowledge. Instead, they wish to implement a framework that's based on morality and ethical education, a model of education that respects and capitalizes on a diverse and culturally rich history. Remaining on the theme of culture, I want to explore numerical and mathematical sequences before we move on. And while most of us know about binary systems within a computer, perhaps one of the oldest binary number sequences can be found in Bagua. With a single row, we can have no divisions, which would be 2 to the power of 0, which equals 1. With one division, it would be 2 to the power of 1, which is equal to 2. With two rows, we could get a total of four possible combinations. And with three rows, we can get a total of eight combinations. Moreover, each of the octets can be subdivided into eight additional subdivisions for a total of 68 values. However, unlike the values on a clock where the num uh, numbers increase numerically, in Bagua, the number sequence is displayed based on opposites finding balance and symmetry through the concepts of yin and yang. However, here we can see the oldest reference to binary and the octal number systems, which are the numbering systems that are used by computer technologies today. 
There are also other numerical sequences that we have used throughout history as well, such as Morse code. Using timed numerical sequences, we were able to transmit data in the early days of electronic communication. Perhaps one of the most well-known examples is SOS, which was a distress signal used to represent save our souls. However, operators and coders for generations have hated typing things out in full. Therefore, abbreviations were adopted. What do you think that this abbreviation might stand for? If you guessed Friday, then you were correct. Now the reason why I wanted to share this with you is that we can use these ideas to build modern day projects. For instance, this Morse code apparatus that I've designed uses electrical components that can be found in the IGCSE physics and design technology curriculums. Now the engineering in this project is quite sophisticated. Therefore, looking to our past can offer a great way to develop projects that are appropriate to our students' current level of understanding. Let's see how it works. While there's nothing wrong with subject-specific lessons or projects, we need to be able to move past these artificially created subdivides if we want to explore STEM education in its truest form. As such, we can start with educational frameworks such as project-based learning and inquiry-based learning, as these are excellent stepping stones which will help us move closer to our final goal of implementing STEM. In this example, I'd like to start with the idea of scale, as it's a concept that's relevant to many different subject areas. For instance, we study things that are far too small for us to see in biology and chemistry, whereas in the fields of architecture and engineering, we need to design and build prototypes in the lab, and we do this before we build much larger structures in the real world. You even need scale in regular day-to-day -day life as well. And if you don't believe me, just ask yourself, have you ever looked at a map while traveling? Therefore, if you had to choose just one idea to teach, I would recommend teaching students about scale. Now before we get into STEM, I want to look at some simple project-based learning examples. However, the first thing we need to do is understand numerical scales and how they can be presented in several different ways. These methods include a written scale, a representative fraction, and a graphic scale. Now a simple project like this might have students calculate the distance between two points using scale conversions. And I would also strongly recommend you require your students to show their process work. And I recommend this because it will help you identify where your students are making mistakes. For instance, I have found that many middle school students can do these kinds of calculations on their own. However, they lack the ability to properly measure an object for themselves. And if your input data is wrong, then your final answer is going to be wrong as well, even if you've done the math correctly. Therefore, by having students show the work, you can quickly perform informal assessments for learning. Another thing that we should also encourage our students to do at this early age is to cross out units, as this will help prepare them for subjects like physics and chemistry later on. Moreover, there's often many similarities between different subjects that we teach in schools. In this example, I'd like to illustrate how domain and range demonstrates these same concepts as latitude and longitude. We have our origin 0, 0 in the center of the graph, and we can move up and down or, or left to right in both cases. Now, in math, we define the values as positive or negative. However, in geography, we define the values by north and south along the y-axis and east to west along the x-axis. Therefore, in both cases, we could have students plot locations on a coordinate plane. And in the case of geography, we could also have the students check their own work by looking up each location in the atlas. Therefore, any project that involves plotting points on a coordinate plane will develop highly transferable skill sets. However, the students did not need to de demonstrate a high level of critical thinking in these, these examples. Therefore, inquiry-based learning will challenge your students even more by encouraging them to ask questions, postulate or theorize ideas, and explore their natural curiosities. Furthermore, projects will become more complex and interdisciplinary. In this case, I have, uh, have mapped the geography of George R. R. Martin's fantasy world from his critically acclaimed novel series. And I chose this example as it, be, it can be properly mapped according to geographic temperate zones. However, when doing this, you'll discover that about 60% of the world has been left undiscovered. 
And this makes sense as most of the story has been inspired by European history at a time when the New World, the Orient, and much of Africa was still undiscovered. Therefore, in this project, students would have had to plot an unknown fantasy world before having to extrapolate what the rest of the undiscovered world might look like based on their understanding of plate tectonics. Here we can see how the students completed this activity. They extrapolated the coastline while also making informed predictions as to what the remaining land masses might look like. And you can see the continents do actually align. And this large southern island aligns nicely with this continent, as if the island has slowly drifted away from the mainland over millions of years, much like Australia has done in the real world. As you can see in this example, we've moved beyond a simple project. We've created a cross-curricular connection between different subjects, sparked the students' interest by igniting their interests, and have created a safe learning environment as there's no definitive right or wrong answer. The validity of the student's solution is directly related to the depth of their inquiry. However, this still isn't STEM education. For STEM, a project needs to be fully cross-curricular. It needs to explore science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in an authentic real-world context, and the project needs to solve a problem in the real world. Therefore, to start our exploration of math and STEM, I'd like to start with this land survey project. In this kind of project, students will learn by doing. They will reverse engineer structures that have been designed by professional engineers and architects, while also learning how to record accurate measurements, perform numerous scale conversions, and create an authentic land survey by hand before digitizing and even 3D printing their work. Moreover, this project can be done with minimal associated costs, and it will develop skills that will prepare your students for a career in the field of STEM. The first step in the process is to get out of the classroom and measure buildings in the real world. And you don't even need to go far to do this. Your school campus is equally as beneficial towards establishing the desired learning outcomes as any other location. At this stage, have your students try their best to complete their rough drafts with as much accuracy as they can. However, we can always correct inaccuracies in the drawing later if we have recorded accurate measurements. Here, you can see the students measuring their school campus in teams, and you don't need expensive equipment to do this. All the students need is a blank design template, clipboard, pencil, ruler, and a low-cost measuring tape. Keep in mind that the students' rough drafts will never be perfect. They'll have mistakes, and the papers will often be creased or torn. Therefore, it's important for students to revise their original design schematics, and this is a great time for students to discuss and resolve issues through mutual collaboration, while also giving them a chance to double check their work. Once the students have an accurate two-dimensional design, we can then start the process of digitizing those designs using the computer. However, we will need to determine the height of each building. That way, we can plot the elevation of each building along the z-axis. We can use transit levels to do this. However, these devices are expensive and difficult to use. Instead, a low-cost clinometer and some trig functions can do the same thing, while also reinforcing concepts that are already being taught in most math curriculums. In these examples, you can see the students working together in pairs, measuring the height of buildings using clinometers, and the formula for tan to solve for the unknown value. Then, with the height of each building known, the students can begin the process of digitizing their designs. Keep in mind that you'll have a range of computer skills in your class, but try pushing your students to make their designs as detailed as they can. And finally, all the students' models can be combined to create a whole school rendering, which can be 3D printed. However, printing projects can add significant cost to your programs, while offering very, very little in terms of developing meaningful learning opportunities for your students. Now that we understand how to move beyond project-based learning and inquiry-based learning, which are both important milestones in the pathway towards STEM ed education, we're now ready to explore how we can create differentiated projects, both within a given class or cohort, and vertically for different grade levels. In the following architectural design project, we want students to be able to accurately measure objects and to perform scale calculations. 
Now, students typically learn scale, proportions, and uh, fractions by grade six. However, they seldomly get to use these skills in an authentic real-world context. That said, by grade seven, students should have the necessary prerequisites to start learning architectural design. However, you should never assume prior knowledge. Therefore, always start by reviewing a concept, gauge the student's familiarity with it, and reteach a concept when it's necessary to do so. Then, have your students solve practice problems for themselves. You can also use the interactive whiteboard function to have students solve problems at the front of the class. With this method, you'll often find that the whole class will work together and try coaching their peers through a problem if they get stuck. And this is the type of supportive learning environment that we want to develop in our classrooms. Now, the reason for these practice problems was to ensure that everyone has a basic understanding of scale before moving on. Much like the land survey, this assignment will have students reverse engineer structures which have been designed by professional designers, while allowing them to get plenty of practice measuring objects and for performing scale calculations. However, I always use standard international units and simple scales in lower grade levels. This way, the students can focus on learning key concepts while reducing confusion from formal technicalities. For instance, imperial measurements involve odd fractions and irregular scale ratios, which can be very confusing at first. And while these concepts are important for a professional, they're not necessary for a student learning the basics of design and engineering for the very first time. After completing all the measurements, the students can then calculate the area and perimeter of each room as needed. Moreover, while some rooms are simple shapes, other rooms in this project have irregular shapes, which builds differentiation right into the project. While most students in grade seven should be able to determine the area of each room on their own, more advanced students will still be challenged by the difficult problems. Moreover, the teacher can spend their time identifying the students that are struggling with the activity and provide direct one-on-one -on -one interventions as necessary. And finally, to finish the project off, you can have your students recreate this drawing at scale, which will reinforce a wide range of uh, skills. Another thing that makes a huge difference is showcasing your student work. While this can be difficult if you don't have your own classroom, I've always created my activities in a way that they can be scanned in bulk. This allows me to add student work to my presentation for the following day and send parents evidence of their child's ongoing progress when necessary. I won't show every project, but I'll select the best student works to show in class. This also helps to create a friendly competition within the class as well, as everyone wants to try to get their work featured. This results in a drastic increase in the quality of the student work, while also reducing behavior issues at the same time. This method also allows you to address common issues through grouped critiques, allowing you to quickly and easily provide effective and timely feedback to your students. For instance, this project is relatively well done. However, the student, student could avoid smudges if they used a cork back ruler or put some tape on the back of a standard ruler to create an air pocket. You can also use this method to provide anonymous feedback to students as well, but make sure you hide the student's name to avoid embarrassing the student in front of their peers. Here, we can see that same apartment with properly scaled furniture samples. While it seems simple, placing furniture on appliances is far more difficult than it sounds. We often see things like beds placed randomly in the center of rooms, large objects placed in small rooms, furniture being placed in high traffic walkways, and some rooms not even having the necessary appliances or fixtures in them. However, these problems can be resolved with group critiques and continued practice. Architectural design projects can also be differentiated for use at different grade levels quickly and easily. For younger students, start with easy to use scale ratios and lots of restrictions to help guarantee success. Then, as students get older, provide them with more freedom to explore more complex ideas. As mentioned before, STEM projects should solve real world problems. Therefore, you should consider the nature of the challenge and what type of restrictions engineers would face in the real world. In this example, I've challenged my students to design a better quarantine shelter. However, there were restrictions placed on the engineers who designed the first rapid response shelters. Therefore, our students should have to work within the same limiting factors. However, I did provide my students with one variable to provide them with some flexibility. I allowed them to use three containers. 
That way they could create a combination of individual or family-sized quarantine shelters. I presented the students with guiding questions such as, will simple changes make a difference? Can we optimize the space that we have? And can we create small spaces with high quality living standards? And I provided my students with ongoing support to help them to create designs that effectively used industry standard design templates. Finally, to have the project reinforce as many learning standards as possible and to model real world practices, I had the students submit the following a research essay in addition to their physical model. And this essay applied ICT skills that are covered in the Grade 7 Huaikao ICT exam while also adhering to MLA formatting guidelines for document formatting. The students also had to explain, justify, and rationalize their design choices, which is the same thing as a professional designer would have to do during a design brief. And we included a personalized reflection on what improvements could still be made into the design. Moreover, while this project example focused on COVID disaster response, this idea of modular construction could be applied to equal friendly living or to a research capsule for a space exploration project. Therefore, the physical project requirements can remain the same from year to year, but the challenge prompt can easily be updated to keep the project new and exciting for each new cohort. With intermediate students, the projects would remain relatively the same. However, we would remove some of the restrictions to allow the students to explore mo more complex ideas. In these examples, you can see the students have designed more sophisticated living spaces. However, they still applied standard design conventions such as guidelines and measurements, properly indicated doors, windows, and walls, and added furniture at the appropriate scale. As for deliverables, I would have the students work at different scales as the smaller designs are quicker and easier to make. I would then have the students enlarge those designs, either by hand or by using the computer so they can make a model at a larger scale. And this is what the project might look like when it's all finished. And for students in senior school who are just about ready to go off to university, that is when I would focus heavily on the use of technology. They have already mastered the basics, and they will be ready to learn the same software platforms that they would be using at university or at a design firm if they've landed a summer internship. In this example, you can see the student's finished display board, and I should also note that all these photographs are not photos from a real apartment. Instead, they're computer-generated images based on the, their computerized design model. Finally, with the advent of generative tools such as AI, universities will want to see evidence of the student's process work, as this is the only way that universities can validate that the work has been done by the student and not by an AL, AI algorithm. Aspiring engineers must also be aware of design regulations as well. These commonly agreed upon sets of standards form a general building code, which are not specific to any one region or country. Now, what is the purpose of a building code? Well, building codes ensure that all structures either meet or exceed safety standards. And this could include, but is not limited to the construction of homes, schools, hospitals, and bridges. And depending on your course, you could explore concepts uh, from the International Building Code, International Residential Code, International Plumbing Code, and the International Fire Code, which all include practical examples of mathematics being used to solve legitimate problems in the real world. 
Therefore, if you don't want to focus on technology, you could emphasize engineering practices instead. In this case, you could consider implementing the following residential design project. First, while I've avoided using imperial measurements in the lower grades, students who have decided to pursue civil engineering will need to learn all the different industry standards. While China has adopted the metric system, the International Building Code uses yards, feet, and inches. And as you can see from the provided table, imperial conversions are not as logical or straightforward as they are with standard international units. Therefore, these types of projects will require students to learn numerical concepts and vocabulary terms which are specific to the field of civil engineering. Another great application of math in this project is what's known as the Bill of Materials. This document will require students to convert their original designs to a structural plan that meets standard international building codes. From there, the students will need to create an inventory of everything that's needed to build the house. This is known as the Bill of Materials, which is a critical component in creating the sales estimate and the subsequent client contract. And finally, this is what this project would look like when finished. However, the physical model is not what's important. The most important thing behind this kind of project is the mathematical concepts that the students explore to get to this point. While I've spent a lot of time on civil engineering so far, aerospace engineering allows us to move away from a predominantly two-dimensional design construct and into the real-world application of three-dimensional thinking. While building rockets is a lot of fun, my primary focus for teaching rocketry has nothing to do with the rocket itself. Instead, the primary focus should always be about targeting specific and relevant math skills. While primary students typically won't have the math skills needed for this kind of project, they're at a great age to develop an interest in rocketry, while also starting to learn how to use their hands to build a working model. For this age group, I like to use a highly structured approach to learning, and I'll use simple do-it-yourself templates. For instance, here I have a simple clinometer that can be used to gauge the height the rocket flew and some basic wing templates to help the students get started. And here you can see how the students are at this age quickly come together, collaborate with one another, and start having lots of fun in the process. However, I find that grade 7 is a perfect age group to get students exploring the mathematics of rocketry, as they will have learnt or are in the process of learning key mathematical concepts that we can apply to the study of rocketry. To start, I always give my students this formula sheet. It reviews the equations for the primitive shapes that the students would have learnt in most middle school curriculums. Therefore, I will reinforce the use of these equations in my STEM projects. Let's start by using these equations to design a custom wing template for our rocket. In engineering, we always start with primitive shapes, which are your squares, triangles, and circles. Then, through a series of Boolean operations, we add and subtract those shapes to create new complex shapes. In this example, we'll start with a perfect square. The formula uh, for the area of a square or rectangle is length times width. We substitute the known values, and we get 25 square centimeters in this example. We're then going to subtract a triangle from the shape and then solve for the area of that triangle. Then we're going to subtract the partial area of this circle. This whole process used a series of Boolean operations to manipulate a series of primitive shapes. And this, is, this has allowed us to design a customized wing that can be used for our rocket. Finally, we can determine the resulting surface area of the wing by adding and subtracting our component values. Then we can determine the volume of the entire rocket. We'll need to break the rocket down into simple shapes, starting with the nose cone, and then the body, which is just a simple cylinder. Finally, we need to subtract the volume of the inner fuel chamber. After modeling your expectations with the students, have each of student in your class create their own design. As the possibilities are nearly limitless, differentiation is inherently built into this kind of project. Students with advanced math skills will undertake designs that push themselves to their limits, while students who struggle with math will explore simpler concepts. However, this does not mean that one rocket is going to be better than the others. Meanwhile, all your students will have explored aspects of three-dimensional geometry, regardless of how simple or complex their designs were. As for deliverables, have each student in your class create their own rocket designs. 
Then, have your students form groups and critique each other's work. During this process, they should select the best elements from their designs before creating an improved rocket design uh, for their final project submission. Having your students submit a revised paper design with accurate measurements and calculations along with a CAD rendering of the same rocket design. And a process video like these can be a great way to help even your shy students become better presenters as they can practice and rehearse what they want to say in a safe environment. As you can see, given the same requirements, the students have produced vastly different rocket designs that they could go on and test in the real world. And these two rocket designs perform particularly well during testing. While I like to focus on the real-world application of geometry in middle school, I like to focus more on advanced concepts with the older students. Even though students in elementary school have not learned trigonometry, I will have students in primary try their best to calculate the height their rocket flew, and this helps to challenge the gifted students in the class. However, I will require students in secondary school to do this as part of their project requirements. That said, one-point calculations are not difficult to do. All you need is a homemade clinometer and trigonometry. In this example, we substitute the value for angle A and, uh, and the adjacent, so that we can solve for the opposite, which represents the height the rocket flew. Two-point calculations will provide even more accuracy as your rocket seldomly flies in a straight line. These are just some of the equations that you can try using, and additional methods can be found on NASA's student website. And for those who are interested, this is what a three-point calculation would look like. You can also explore chemical propulsion as well by creating your own rocket fuel, calculating the predicted thrust of the rocket, and comparing your predictions to the data that you collected from testing your rocket in the real world. However, I won't spend a lot of time on this concept as I've already covered it a lot during the Applied Chemistry workshop. Much like the design of rockets, structural engineering projects provide students with an excellent opportunity to explore what they're learning in an authentic way. While lots of schools do simple popsicle stick bridges, we seldom see quality connections being made with the math and science curriculums, and part of that has to do with the limitations of, those, of the chosen medium. Therefore, I prefer working with pine wood strips instead of popsicle sticks, because at the end of the day, pine wood is more versatile, while also being cheaper, and more environmentally friendly than popsicle sticks. However, before I have the students do anything, I always start by establishing meaningful connections to the curriculum. For example, Bridges are made using trusses, which are created using triangular sections that are called nodes. I will then have the students work in groups of two to create a small bridge. This simple bridge uh, concept will be based on a set of schematics that I've given them. Now the main reason for having the students build this mini bridge is to provide them with an opportunity to learn how multiple two-dimensional trusses can get assembled to create a frame or three-dimensional structure, while also allowing them a chance to develop the tactile skills that they will need for the final project. After that, we can slowly introduce new ideas and concepts, so, uh, specifically how loads and forces of gravity affect structures such as a bridge. In this example, we can see what a simple truss looks like. Then, if we apply a load, we can start identifying how different stress factors affect certain parts of the bridge. We can then use this information to make informed decisions when designing our own bridges. From there, we can introduce students to a wide range of different truss designs. These design concepts will spark the student's interest and promote the idea of asking questions. What bridge design will be the strongest? Why do I believe this to be true? What evidence can I provide to support my hypothesis? 
How would I go about testing my idea? And can I combine different ideas to make an even stronger bridge design? After each design, its own unique advantages. For instance, the strong modular design of the Bailey Trust was influential in supporting Allied troop movements during World War II. While I don't have time to go through the history and structural benefits of each design, I'll jump ahead to the, the end of the list. Because the Warren Trust is one of the world's most widely used trust designs. It can be found in the designs of bridges, airplanes, cranes, and the roofs of most large open commercial structures, such as your school gymnasium. Now that we've developed some relevant background knowledge, our students will now be ready to make informed decisions when creating their own bridge designs. In this regard, they're not just copying existing designs. Instead, they're benefiting from understanding our historical advancements in bridge designs so that they can take the, um, the next evolutionary step by creating new and innovative designs for the future. And this reminds me of another quote by Confucius. Knowledge without practice is useless. Practice without knowledge is dangerous. Therefore, now that we have given the students some ideas, it's time to let them start evaluating the pros and cons of the different design approaches and strategies. They'll also want to establish reasonable limits for the students to work within. For instance, if the students were to design a Warren truss, they would only be working with equilateral triangles. If they made the length of each side of the triangles 12 centimeters, they could build a, tr a bridge that's 72 centimeters long. With this simple calculation, they've ensured that their project is within the stated limits, while also ensuring that their designs will have easy to measure segments. However, other designs will require different calculations to optimize the design of the bridge based on the stated limitations. For instance, this combination of a Baltimore bridge with a Bailey truss cross-section would require more calculations than a bridge using a simple Warren truss design. Again, we can see how the students begin differentiating the project for themselves. Therefore, differentiation doesn't need to be overly complicated or time-consuming if you plan your projects accordingly. Much like all the other projects that I do, the project itself is just a way for me to reinforce mathematical concepts through authentic, real-world learning activities. Therefore, I usually teach bridges in grade 8 because they are typically learning about complementary ang angle theorems at this time. As the students are working on their bridges, I have them consider how they would classify the nodes in their designs. For instance, we could classify the triangles by their sides, equilateral, isosceles, and scalene or we can classify them by their angles, acute, obtuse, and right angles. We can reinforce key concepts such as complementary and adjacent angles, as well as supplementary angles. We can review concepts such as the sum of line segment, for instance, the missing angle in this example was 50 degrees, and parallel lines as well. Then we can discuss how transversal lines can intersect with parallel lines, which results in alternate interior angle pairings and alternate exterior angle pairings. However, the main reason why we wanted to review these mathematical concepts is to have the students apply what they're learning to the designs of their own bridges. And as you can see in this example, bridges are a great way to apply these concepts in an authentic real-world environment. After completing individual designs, I then have the students critique their partner's work. I then introduce a twist, which is the process of talent scouting, or poaching. I introduced this twist mid-project for a few reasons. It allows the groups to disband and reformulate if they were not working well together. And it also allows the students to explore the strategic and ethical aspects of trying to recruit or steal the best talent in the class, which is something that happens in the real world. However, it also makes the project more sustainable. As the group sizes increase from two to three members, the number of full-size bridges that are being made has been reduced. This also reduces the material cost that is associated with the project. It also reduces the number of resources that are consumed and wasted in the process, which lowers the overall environmental project of doing the project as well. Finally, after designing and uh, building a physical prototype, I then have each group digitize their designs and make a process video that showcases their work.
As for testing your bridges, there's a few ways you can do it. You can always suspend a pail from the center of the bridge and slowly fill it with sand until you hear a crack. However, if you want a more scientific approach to testing your bridges, you can always use these structure testers from either Pitsco or Veneer. While these testers are great for the types of pro uh, bridges that I've just shown you, the structure kit from Pasco is a little bit different. It focuses less on the engineering and design process and more on exploring advanced mathematical concepts. Using this kit, students can rapid prototype different truss designs. Then, using different sensors, your students can determine the cross products of the different stress factors throughout the entire structure. While the Petsco and Veneer kits are perfect for middle school students, Pasco has a truly unique structure kit that's well suited to IGCC, IB, and AP test preparation. The last idea that I want to explore in today's presentation is to focus on the exploration of graphical representations that are based on mathematical concepts. Whether you're designing objects by hand or on the computer, you need to understand booleans. These are the basic operations of adding, subtracting, and intersecting objects to create new shapes. Here, in these examples, we can see how shape A and B have been added together, how B has been subtracted from A, how A has been subtracted from B, and where A and B intersect with one another. But how do we use primitives to design objects? In this example, we'll start a design of a machine part. We'll start by drawing a rectangular prism. We will then subtract a smaller rectangle from the first object. This is known as a subtractive boolean. Next, we'll repeat the process, removing another rectangle from the bottom in the back of the shape. We now have a complex shape. We are then going to add new elements to our design, modify those elements, and then add what's called chamfer, which is the rounding of edges on an object. We're now left with a, com a completed machine part that we've designed at scale using graph paper and Boolean operations. And this is how your students can apply these techniques as they design toys, consumer products, and even industrial machine parts. However, another thing you could consider having your students do is calculate the slope and the domain and range of each line segment needed to create these objects. You could have them do this using pencil and paper, or you can even have them do this using applications such as GeoBra and Desmos Math. Now you might ask yourself, how is this activity relevant or authentic? Well, vector applications create images using mathematical equations. This allows the image to be scaled indefinitely as the value for x can be adjusted by the software. The software application then recalculates all the necessary values and displays the image as an, at the new size. Therefore, this activity allows your students to explore the differences between bitmap and vector graphics. Moreover, software engineers who are creating these kinds of programs need to develop software algorithms that can recognize and convert shapes to mathematical equations just like we've done in these examples. Therefore, there is a real-world application to what we've just reviewed um, in this project idea. Finally, as you can see from this corporate identity manual, the entire logo design has been stated in values of x, and the domain and range for each line segment has been stated. Therefore, students will still need to understand math, even if they want to pursue a career in artistic fields of study, such as graphic design. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope that you found this presentation informative, and that you've been able to take away several ideas that you might consider trying in your own classroom. And with that said, I would like to thank you for attending this presentation of Applied Mathematics in STEM.